Good evening. In this very special program, we're going to talk about something that won't happen again for over a hundred years, so make the most of it. And this is a transit of Venus. As we know, there are two planets closer to the sun than we are, Mercury and Venus. And when they pass in transit, you see them pass across the sun as black spots. And you see the last one? You couldn't see it well from here. You could from the Arctic island of Svalbard, and that's where three of our Sky at Night team went. So, over to Chris in Svalbard. The archipelago of Svalbard is a starkly glamorous part of the Arctic Circle, 78 degrees north of the equator. Home to eider ducks, polar bears, and the town of Longyearbyen, it's a magical place. This is the land of the midnight sun, which is just as well because we'll need that to see the whole transit. It begins just after midnight local time. The weather's not too bad for this part of the world, and I really hope it stays clear because the next transit doesn't happen until the 22nd century. So this is really my last chance. I've never been this far north before. Svalbard is, after all, not that far from the North Pole, and it's already been quite an adventure getting here. The sun remains at the same height above the horizon throughout the day, an effect that feels distinctly disorientating to those of us from more southerly climes. Lucy Green and Pete Lawrence have joined me on this quest. It's the night before the transit, and we're going on a voyage with a team of European scientists who work on the Venus Express mission. Venus Express has spent the last six years studying Earth's evil twin, trying to work out why Venus is quite so different from our own world. Amongst those trying to solve its mysteries is Colin Wilson, who helped set up this extraordinary trip. Planetary transits are the only way we have of characterising exoplanets. These are planets discovered around other stars, of which we've discovered hundreds in the last, in the last decade We've or discovered two. them because, in some cases, because they go in front of because the best of the star. transits. Uh, but then, once we know the planets are there, these exoplanets, we try to characterise them, we try to say, is it, does it have water, does it have oxygen, could it be conceivably a nice place to live, or is someone may already live? Uh, and to, to study that, the only technique we have is planetary transits. Here we have a very rare event, which is a transit of an Earth-like planet in front of a Sun-like star. And once we've done that analysis, we can, we can actually look, at, look up the right answers, because uh, satellites like Venus Express are giving us the detailed composition, and we can tell whether the transit analysis has been right. Colin and his colleagues may be here for astronomical reasons, but the boat trip's also a chance to see the magnificent scenery of Svalbard and even spot some wildlife. There he is. Oi. Well, it's a beautiful evening up in Svalbard, a beautiful location. What do you reckon, Lucy? Not a bad place for a transit. This is absolutely perfect. We've got fantastic clear skies at the moment, which bodes well. And, you know, it's been, it was quite a journey getting here, so... I'm full of excitement and I can't wait to see how the sun looks in terms of the sunspots as well as seeing the black disk of Venus moving across as well. Yeah, and of course we're here because we need to see the sun just after midnight. The sun is up for the entire day and all night. Yeah, it's half seven at night and the sun's still up there. It's pretty, pretty nice and it sinks to about 10 degrees above the horizon. That's right. Pete, you've been doing some um, careful observation of the conditions. What did you make of your, your day here so far? Well, in the morning I was actually quite depressed about things because there was thick cloud everywhere and, it, and there was no wind so nothing was moving. But then suddenly, as if by magic, it just disappeared completely. So I got the telescope out, tested the telescope and I actually managed to find Venus, which is really close to the sun at the moment. We're not very many hours before the transit and um, I now feel at home. Well, I'm looking forward to it. I think for tonight I'm going to enjoy the boat trip, see a bit of Svalbard yeah. and our surroundings and if the weather's like this tomorrow then I will be deeply, deeply happy. <laughs> I think I'll be happy too. <laughs> We're not the first to travel for a transit of Venus. Previous generations have scrambled to the far ends of the globe whenever these rare events come round. <laughs> so we've just come to a grinding halt. We've hit some ice. It feels appropriate, actually, given the hardships and the struggles that the previous transit expeditions went through. Our boat journey comes to an end exactly 24 hours before the transit, with brilliantly clear, midnight sunlit skies making Longyearbyen look rather tranquil. 
I feel rather less calm, it has to be said. We need these clear skies to last until tomorrow. This will be only the seventh transit of Venus ever observed. And the reason transits are so rare is down to a little bit of celestial mechanics. To get a transit, we need the Sun, Venus and Earth to be exactly in a straight line. But that doesn't happen every day. It needs a special set of circumstances. The solar system is dynamic, and Venus, being much closer to the Sun than the Earth is, orbits more rapidly, taking only 225 days to do one lap. Whereas I, over here for the Earth, take, of course, a whole year to go round. In fact, I only catch up with the Earth after 584 days. And you'd think that there'd be a transit every 584 days. But that's not actually what happens. When we look at the orbits of Venus and the Earth, we see that they're tilted with respect to each other by just over three degrees. And that means that even when this alignment happens, sometimes Venus passes underneath the Sun from the Earth's perspective, and at other times it's moving above the Sun from the Earth's perspective. And in that case, a transit doesn't happen. So all of this only comes together very, very rarely. In fact, it happens twice, eight years apart, separated by a gap of more than a century. So that's why we have to wait so long for the next transit of Venus. By the 18th century, astronomers were making incredible efforts to chase transits of Venus. Their aim was to get observations of the transit from all over the world. One famous expedition was led by Captain Cook, and they observed the transit from Tahiti in 1769 before they ran into Australia on their way home. By timing how long it took for the planet Venus to pass in front of the Sun, astronomers realised they could measure the Sun's distance from the Earth. Observing the transit was therefore a high scientific priority. But once mixed in with efforts to improve navigation, it also became a matter of national prestige, as scientists persuaded governments and navies to lend them a hand, as well as plenty of funding. Lucy and I took a trip up the hill overlooking Longyearbyen to talk about the successes and the failures of previous transit expeditions. Chris, I feel like we've had quite a trek coming up here to be on this beautiful mountain, but really it's nothing compared to the lengths that the previous transit expeditions went to. Well, actually, I think we've done pretty well. We've come all the way up to the Arctic, but uh, you're, you're quite right, of course, particularly the 18th century transits, when they were trying to use the transit of Venus to measure the solar system. And they sent observers right across northern Europe to try and get as many uh, observations as possible. Um, what we don't have, and we really needed, were observations from India. And in particular, there was a poor Frenchman called Le Gentil. Ah, the unluckiest astronomer of all time. He is. He set off in 1760 to see the 1761 transit. Um, he gets attacked by the British. The, the world was at war at that point. It was the Seven Years' War. They only escape because of fog. He makes it to Madagascar. Um, doesn't make it to Pondicherry, the uh, French colony in India, because of the war. In fact, the British have taken it. And so he ends up observing the transit of Venus from the deck of a ship really rather poorly. Which, of course, would be moving all the time. Exactly. No good for precision observations. But also, they need to know where on the Earth they are. And he can't get good measurements as to where this ship is. Uh, and so he decides, quite sensibly, that instead of going all the way back to France, he's going to hang around for the 1769 transit. <laughs> so he waited for eight years, which, you know, when you've gone to those lengths, I, I suppose you might as well do. The whole month before the transit was beautifully clear. He gets up every morning and it's clear skies. And then on the morning of the transit, he writes in his journal that he woke up about two in the morning. He could hear the wind whipping in off the sea and he knew that that meant clear mm. weather. But, as you know, he wandered outside, looked up, and it was completely overcast. Mm. And he comes back and he describes throwing himself face down onto the bed. Uh, and he writes, such is the fate of astronomers. <laughs> uh, and in fact, he went mad. This is only the seventh transit to be witnessed by humanity. And we've, but we've come so far from working out the size of the solar system to looking for life elsewhere in our universe. Well, first of all, let's hope we see it. Well, I'm beginning to understand just how Le Gentil must have felt, because the clouds have rolled in. The sun is now completely obscured, leaving us more than a little worried about the forecast for tomorrow's transit. Inspired by the plucky astronomers of the 18th and 19th centuries, we could do nothing but grit our teeth and hope for the best.
Well, while we wait for the skies to clear, we set up our very own transit up here in the snow. And transits occur whenever there are three bodies in a row. So we've got the Earth, we've got a purple ping pong ball pretending to be Venus, and then of course we've got the Sun back here. But what you see during a transit depends on exactly where you are. The observers on the Earth experience an effect known as parallax, which means that observers near the North Pole see Venus in one position against the disk of the Sun, but you'll notice that towards the South, Venus appears in a different place against the face of the Sun. And so with that measurement, they only needed to know one more thing. They needed to know the relative distance from the Sun out here to Venus, and then from Venus back to the Earth. And that's something that had been known since the 1600s, thanks to the work of Kepler, who realised that the orbits of the planets around the Sun had a special relationship to how far each planet was from the Sun. And so that was it. With those two measurements, the speed the planets were moving and the observations of the transits, the observers were able to set out the scale of the solar system for the very first time. There are only two planets which transit the Sun as seen from Earth, Venus and Mercury. Let's go back to Patrick to hear more about these two enigmatic worlds. Time now to talk about the inner solar system. With me are Chris North and Paul Abel. Well, these planets are very different, so let's begin with little Mercury. Yes, I have it here, the usual sky at night model. Yes, here we yes. have <laughs> Wonderful little Mercury. <clears throat> In fact, uh, Mercury, one of the ancient planets known since antiquity, our earliest cavemen must have seen it whizzing around in the sky. We had to wait till the start of the telescopic era before we could begin making any investigations of it. And even then, we didn't see an awful lot. Well, no, we didn't really know much until the, 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 the space age. Well, that's right. The, the reason being, of course, Mercury is very small and it's very close to the sun, and this makes it very difficult to observe. Schiaparelli, of course, made lots of observations of it. We had to wait until, uh, was it Mariner 10 that got out to Mercury first? Yeah. Yeah, so Mariner 10 went around, the, uh, passed it by in the 1970s, and made the first observations. One of the problems with Mercury is that it's so close to the Sun that if we send a spacecraft there from Earth, it's a third of the distance from the Sun. And as the spacecraft goes inwards, uh, it gets faster and faster and faster, which means that it whizzes past Mercury. So the biggest problem with going to orbit around Mercury is actually slowing down <laughs> enough. Yes. Um, so the messenger spacecraft had a very convoluted journey uh, to actually end up going into orbit around Mercury and is the first spacecraft to ever go into orbit. Oh, everything else, Mariner 10, just passed straight by. So, up next then, the planet Venus. Now, this is a uh, interesting world. It couldn't be more farther removed from Mercury. Um, shrouded with a very thick, poisonous atmosphere. Um, a lovely, bright object. Planet of beauty. Go there and you'll find anything beautiful. Well, indeed, yes. It's more like hell. With the space age, um, we've had probes that have actually gone to Venus. Similarly, the earlier probes were squashed on the way down. They were, uh, yes. They so didn't make it to the surface. Uh, the pressure on the surface of Venus is 90 times the pressure on the surface of Earth. Um, so they had to go and build their spacecraft again to try and survive the pressures, and they got to the surface and discovered it. the temperature on the surface is 400 degrees. The longest a probe has survived on the surface was Venera 13 in the 1980s, I think. So that was sent back that lovely image. It's one of my favourite ones, a little bit of glowing sky. <laughs> so that was lasted for 127 minutes. That's yeah. just over two hours before finally its electronics overheated. Uh, I think we could forgive it for that. Well, yes, <laughs> I wouldn't like to survive in that kind of environment. No, I but wouldn't, no. To make it worse, the atmosphere is very dense, the atmosphere is very, the surface is very hot, um, and you have sulfuric acid clouds oh. to contend with. Um, we've had probes uh, go there, so we had the Magellan probe in the 1990, which made a radar map, so using radar that can penetrate the very, very thick clouds. Uh, and, and was able to map the surface and show us uh, mountains, volcanoes, in fact, um, possibly, or probably not active, certainly not very many of them active, uh, and, and valleys and, and so on, and lava flows. Are There's very interesting flows. structures on the surface as well, like those sort of pancake shapes. Uh, very, very weird surface. All kinds, of, all kinds of volcanoes. Both Mercury and Venus are inferior planets. They are closer to the Sun than we are. And from our point of view, occasionally, they pass in front of the Sun in an event known as a transit. And the best place to study the Sun is, in fact, uh, from the very northern climes uh, of Europe in Svalbard. <laughs> and, and the team, uh, Chris, Lucy and Pete, have been there. So, back now to Svalbard. 
It's 11 o'clock at night here in Svalbard. The Transit of Venus festivities have begun. It's still light, as you can see, which is great. It's also pretty cloudy, which isn't. Uh, there are a few breaks in the clouds, though, so we haven't given up hope yet. But whatever happens in about an hour from now, the last Transit of Venus of the 21st century will have begun, whether we're able to see it or not. Most of Svalbard is here, and the locals are getting into the spirit of the occasion. The longer we're here, the more I begin to sense what life in this frontier land must be like. Well, previous explorers who have travelled to see the transit of Venus found all sorts of things, so I pretty much imagine this is what those Arctic explorers encountered back in the 18th century. What I have here is the, um, the low-tech way of watching the transit of Venus. So this is a simple solar viewer. The light comes in through um, the glass at the front, bounces off some mirrors on the inside, and then down through a lens. And actually, it projects an image of the sun a few inches across on the piece of paper in here. So this is a really simple um, and really safe way to look at the transit of Venus. And I should be able to see the event happening really clearly with this piece of kit. But also using this, I can see sunspots that are on the surface of the sun. And I know at the moment there are some really fantastic sunspot groups. So I'm looking forward to seeing just how close Venus gets to those. The skies are still ominously heavy, but Miguel and Michelle from the European Space Agency have set up their telescopes nonetheless. They'll be sending images of the transit live onto the web, but only if those clouds clear. Also here are the Venus Twilight Experiment, a global collaboration in the best tradition of transit hunting, with teams in Japan, in Hawaii, in Kazakhstan, and even in Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia. All of these teams are waiting to catch something called the Arc of Venus, or more scientifically, the Oriole. It occurs when the sun's light is seen shining directly through the thick Venusian atmosphere, rather than being reflected by it. And it occurs for just a few fleeting seconds, around the beginning and the end of the transit. There will be sort of a ring of light around Venus, uh, which is fantastic actually to, to see. And we have uh, great expectations on, the, on the, how beautiful it, this should be. It's mostly uh, visible during what we call the first contact, which is when Venus hits the Sun, and the second contact, when Venus is now fully plunged into the face of the Sun. So it's a matter of 15 to 20 minutes. The arc of Venus was seen during the 2004 transit, both from the TRACE spacecraft and by amateur astronomers on the ground. Remarkably, we can even see detail in the arc, revealing the layers of Venus's atmosphere. In 1882, there were only visual and uh, some photographies, but the photographies didn't see the aureola. Only drawings by expert observers mentioned this aureola as it was also mentioned in the 18th century events in 1761 and 1769. The telescope works by blocking out the sun so that the delicate arc of light can be revealed, but setting it up in Svalbard has been tricky. We wanted to observe from here because this is the only part of Europe that can actually see both ends of the transit, the ingress, what we call the ingress, which is when Venus comes into the sun, and the egress, which is the opposite. And for that, we had to use uh, portable equipment because there is no uh, major astronomical facility here or fixed facility. And this is a, also a, something which is uh, difficult for any astronomer to align a um, portable uh, motorized mount. You always need to aim at the pole in a very accurate manner. And this is the midnight sun period of the year, so there are no stars at all. So this is difficult to do. It's nice to see that the French and the British can set up next to each other without war breaking out. A little bit different from the 18th century, but we do still share some problems with that unluckiest of astronomers, Le Gentil. After all, the thick clouds are still hanging about and time is beginning to run out. Look, I'm not a natural optimist, <laughs> but that looks much like it did just before we got that clear patch half an hour ago. Well, if it's it does before. go, it's going to be a real rush because I think that's a, even see Do you see what I mean? Sun. I think that's breaking in yeah. between the different bands. We might just get a crack. That, that's all we need. Yeah. Actually, I don't actually know where the sun is up there at the moment, but you, if you see those rays in the distance, I think it's, they're pointing back to it. That's yeah. right. 
Really? Has it moved all the way around over? It, to has, yeah. it has, yeah. Uh, well, We've then been I'm waiting a while. I'm probably wrong, though. It's so bizarre because we're now, well, obviously coming up to midnight. Here we go. And it's daylight. It is, which is good. <laughs> for a transit, that's excellent. <laughs> this is yeah. the thing for transit and Venus explorers. We're in the right place at the right time Under with our equipment. <laughs> well, we can't control the weather. We can't yeah. control the weather. The transit will be a long affair, lasting nearly seven hours, but the beginning and end are dramatic. The tension is running high. We're getting another glimpse of the sun coming out, but not the full um, the full disc. But will it be enough for Pete to get his telescopes now? Oh, such a tease. Well, Lucy, you were telling me yesterday that you wanted to see something called the black drop, which you only see on the way in and out. That's so. right. So this elongation of the disk of Venus when it's close to the edge of the sun. And actually, since the last transit, people have put forward an explanation for why that happened. So I, I want to see it myself and then later on see other people's opinions. It's the sun's oh. right there, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> We've got a few minutes We've got to go. A, yeah, about six on. minutes left. We've Come flown on. all this way. We've bought all this kit. It could do it, actually. I'm going to change tack. You're gonna, you're gonna I'm going to go to white stick. light now yeah. Ooh, and okay. have a look. I'm going for it. Go on, then. Do we need to get out your way, Pete? No, no, you're fine there. Yeah, I'll Patrick just... tells a story of an eclipse in Finland where he was the only person to leave his kit. Yes, uh, I know. And, at the and last he was the only minute. one that got the picture. Yeah. yeah. You've got to be optimistic, Come haven't you? You on. just don't know what the cloud's going to do. No, it's just thin enough to give us a little bit of hope. Yeah, and this telescope will track the sun. It will if I can find the sun yeah. so first. Once, once we're locked on. <laughs> yeah. Well, somebody locally predicted it was going to clear. The clouds were clear at midnight. Yeah, but also, according to Ian, they were sitting on their porch with a beer when they predicted that. So. That can make you more optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> this is astronomical torture. Goodness knows how those who'd staked their career on transit observing must have felt. Well, about two minutes left. Two minutes left. It's, it's not, not looking good. It's not. My optimism was there for a second. It's <laughs> yeah, faded already. Yeah, I peaked for about 30 seconds and, and now it's gone. There's a yeah. higher level of cloud that's come in that wasn't there, yeah. literally wasn't there half an hour yeah. ago. It's really grey. Really, really grey. The sun is just there, near that gap in the clouds. And we've got the telescope, so we just need... Oh, is that the sun's... No, it's not the sun's no. disc, is it? Is it? Is it? <gasps> that could... No. No. It's too is far it? over. Well, I'll, yes, it is. I'll go with anything. It, it I'll is. go with anything. Well, was, yes, it is. It is. Yeah. <gasps> is it? Yes, it is. Yes, There's it is. the sun. Pete, well spotted. Two minutes to go. Okay. This would just be the most magical piece of time. <laughs> come on. Oh, my goodness. Come on. It's not bright enough to register through the filter. A minute and a half. It's about to, go. to brighten, Pete. It's about to brighten. We've got the top bit as well, which is what we is need. Is that where it is? Yeah, it comes in across the top. Well, um, yes. We're already aligned. Not. I think some <gasps> people over there have got it. Literally 20 seconds and the sun's just come out. I'm so I think some people the over there have got it. We've heard some gas. We can see the sun. Can Pete get his telescope on it, though? That's the question. It's going to disappear again. Oh, come on. Ah, if I said it No, no. <laughs> A clear patch in the right place at the right time, and Pete gets his first shot of the transit of Venus. Pete, I can't quite believe we've got this, and I won't distract you too much, but just at the point where Venus started crossing the sun, we've got a clear patch, and there is the last chance you'll have for 105 years to see Venus beginning to cross the face of the sun. Even though the clouds are there, it still sort of sends tingles up the back of your neck, sort actually. Sort of dramatic with the clouds going past, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Proof that the solar system is working. It's a sunspot up there in the top There are left loads of well. sunspots on there, which is sort of really quite photogenic. It's like the sun is a canvas against the... Um, in which the transit is taking place. That's very nice. Yeah, I thought so too. Yeah. Mm. Venus has begun its long crawl across the sun's disk, a majestic demonstration of the power of celestial mechanics. But we are still at the mercy of nature. So if the clouds weren't here, we should be seeing Venus now just passing over the edge of the sun. We've had first contact, and in a few minutes' time, we'll have second contact. So maybe we'll catch that one. Lucy, we've got it. It's well, actually behind some thick now. cloud. Right. It's just about there. Oh, yes, there it is. There it is. It's moving quite wow. quickly onto the disk, isn't it? It's it, maybe oh, halfway there fast. now. Yeah. 
Wow. My goodness. So we've got 10 minutes now until second contact. That's right, when oh. the Venus is it's completely fully inside. inside. That's right. And when we can uh, see if we can see the infamous black drop. Oh, yeah. It's very it black at the exist. minute. Previous observers reported that something strange happens as Venus moves onto the Sun's disk. It seems to stretch, forming the infamous black drop. We'll have to wait and see if the black drop is real. For now, I'm with Pete, a sceptic. It's like if you hold your finger and thumb up um, and you have them close to you, and as you put them close together, it looks like your finger and uh, thumb yeah. begin to join together. Yeah. That's yeah, one theory. And in bad optics. Well, you've yeah. got a little layer of heat yeah. between your finger and thumb, and I think yeah. that just distorts the view slightly. Everyone is just ecstatic that after our long wait, we are finally getting a glimpse of Venus. These are some of the first views from spacecraft looking at the sun. In these amazing movies, we see Venus entering the sun's disk with all the magnetic texture in breathtaking detail. It's both beautiful and astounding at the same time. It's like so Have clear. Have you seen this? And you it's, got go. the, it's got all the ridges in it. It, it looks does. like a, it yeah. looks like an ether logo. But you can see the disc really, really clearly. Yeah. Yeah, it looks terrific. It's really clearly defined. It's touch and go at the minute. One moment the sun's there and then it's gone. But we've still seen it. I think we should settle in for the night, guys, because that's gone oh, behind definitely. a very large yeah. bank of cloud. So mm. transit is underway. We've seen we some saw of it. some of it. Yep. So mission accomplished, as far as I'm concerned. And now everything else is just gravy. Do you think? Yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. Gentlemen, how is it for you? How's it going? Of course, stressy. Because because nothing we can do nothing automatically, so we have to do it manually. Because of the clouds. Because of the clouds means that we have to adjust the cameras they set up for every shot. But you've managed to see something. Yes, and it's so exciting. We had to take the filter out, in fact, so that uh, we could see the, the image of the sun through the clouds. So the cloud was the filter. Looking at the sun is incredibly dangerous, so do always use filters or project its image and be very careful with the telescope. Some news from the Twilight team. No luck in Svalbard, but they've heard from Arizona that there's been a successful observation of the arc of Venus. The report I just received uh, says that they observed the Aurora very well. It was uh, quite bright, uh, very asymmetrical, as expected. And Which is what you wanted, because that's the interest. Expect, and it was uh, um, more intense near the pole, which is what one. And moreover, it was also observed well before the first contact. Ah, great. Which okay. means we'll have a long photometric curve on each of the points on the Venus atmosphere. And this is what we want, because uh, the longer the, way, the, the curve, the light curve is for each point, the best constraint we have on the temperature at the point we try to measure. And what about Ulaanbaatar? Have you heard from them? No, but I think they don't have a fast internet there, so I'm, I don't expect them to call during the transit. So we've got the sunspots that we can see really clearly. Oh, yeah, there they are. A variety of sizes um, and a, a real cluster of them, actually. So There's Venus, an enormous number there, aren't there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, I can see the umbra and the penumbra yeah. of yeah, some of those sunspots. The yeah. faint shadow around the sunspot. That's spot. right. And then Venus, of course, with no penumbra, just the big black dot moving across the face Isn't of the Isn't that sun. a fantastic sight there? With <laughs> Venus is hey, just listen, so you perfect. you get your solar scope out. It's bright it's enough now. It's bright enough now, I think. Finally, we've got a shadow on here that I can use to align it now. There we go. Yes. There we go. There's Venus and one, two, three, four, five, six sunspots, maybe. Fantastic. And what I like about this sunspotter is that because the Earth is rotating so fast, the sun is moving out of the field of view of my sunspotter, so I'm always having to make an adjustment every few minutes. It'd be much easier if the Earth didn't rotate. Working out the sun Earth distance would be much easier as well. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Have you seen it with the naked eye yet? Or no, with the I glasses? haven't given so that a go. Let's give that let's a go. Let's see if we can see this. Okay. Oh, yeah. Ah. There it is. I can see it. That's rather nice. Actually, there's a band of cloud that looks rather pretty as it well. It does. The sun is always changing, and one feature that comes and goes are sunspots. These can be bigger than the Earth and are areas of cool gas at the surface. 
Right now, there is a group of sunspots and also something called a filament where the sun's magnetic field is holding up gas. I'm trying to see Venus with a hydrogen alpha filter. The sun is so bright that, of course, it makes it difficult to see any detail on your uh, computer screen. But with my patented black shroud, which got a lot of interest from some of the locals yesterday, <laughs> Um, it helps me to, to see the detail. I study the sun every day using spacecraft that look at it in different ways. Each wavelength tells you something different. One thing I wanted to ask you, Lucy, was Pete's been imaging in hydrogen alpha. Uh, so what exactly is that and what are we seeing in these mm. alpha images? So in hydrogen alpha, this is a narrow part of the visible spectrum that the filter allows through. And it's a really useful part of the spectrum to use because it sees not the lowest part of the sun's atmosphere, which we call the photosphere. That's the bit we normally see in most of the images. That's right. So when you see sunspots, it's normally the photosphere that's being imaged. But the hydrogen alpha sees a layer of the atmosphere slightly higher, a layer that we call the chromosphere, and this is the orange or uh, the, well, the red layer that you see during a total eclipse. And what you pick up is all the activity on the sun. So I noticed in one of Pete's images, as Venus moved across, you had some what looked like sort of squiggly lines just yeah. above it. Are those the filaments? That's right. So these are the filaments. These are sort of, they look like snakes on the surface that's of right, the sun. Yeah. And then when you see them at the edge, we call them prominences. But oh, they're when they stick out. That's right. But they're exactly the same thing. So they are relatively cool gas that's held up in the sun's atmosphere a little bit higher and I was really pleased to see that there's a really nice sort of S-shaped one on the sun at the moment so there's a dispersed sunspot group that we were looking at in white light. That's right, yeah. yeah. That. And then when we moved up and looked in the hydrogen alpha filter we saw not really the sunspot so much but we saw the um, the filament that was also in that sunspot group. So then we start to go up into the, hot, into the atmosphere which is fairly hot. I mean, it goes from 6,000 degrees centigrade at the surface up into millions in the atmosphere. And that's, you're right, that's what we start to see from space. So we start to look in ultraviolet light, extreme ultraviolet light, and then even x-rays coming from the so, hot atmosphere. So I know some sun. of the satellites saw the transit before we did, because, of course, they see the uh, Venus going through the sun's atmosphere before it crosses onto that's the That's right, yeah. So now is a really nice era to have a transit of Venus, because you're making use of the light all across the electromagnetic spectrum. So it's going to be some fantastic images that come it through. It is sort of magical being here and seeing it the old-fashioned way and having the space-based images mm. as well. Pretty yeah. exciting. Colin has an ingenious arrangement with which to view Venus, and it's a safe way to look at the sun by projecting it. The transit's really a rather special sight, even at three in the morning. This is something I borrowed from a, from a colleague, uh, and it does look a bit like a pizza box. Uh, it is a bit of folded cardboard. You get quite a good image. Yeah, you've got yeah. the sunspots there and yeah. Venus, and it must be about mid-transit, I would say. Yeah, maybe looks just about mid-transit. Just so. past. You're of course involved with Venus Express, which is going around Venus. What's it doing right now? Do you think will it be making observations during the transit? Yeah, so uh, it's got a 24-hour orbit, which is convenient, so we know exactly where it is in its orbit. Uh, at this time of day, in fact, around 3 in the morning, is usually when it comes to its closest to Venus. Uh, it could be searching for lightning right now, because uh, we only are sensitive to that when we're uh, within the, the, the magneto sheath, that, that's the magnetic you're close field. In. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've seen the signs of lightning now. I, I don't think you'll see flashes. Not if even look, if I look closely and you'll <laughs> you look really scary. closely, no, no, no. <laughs> As well as the transit, I've been enjoying my first experience of the midnight sun. It's weird to think that we've been up all night and it never got dark. Despite the fact, though, that the light hasn't changed, it is morning, and we're all beginning to feel a bit of night shift strain. But it's time to wake up, because the end of the transit is approaching. We're not far off the black drop here, actually. Look, this, this is Venus getting very close now. This would be the point where you were struggling if you were trying to measure the scale of mm. the solar system. This would be the point, wouldn't it, when you were just trying to time things very cool, precisely. Yeah. yeah, it's really wobbling around in the atmosphere. The atmosphere there, is very it? poor. It's yeah, really, really poor. But it's we're just. I think I could still see some gap. So it's hard. There That's go. it. There you go. That's, That's a black drop. Yes. Ha. That's so. So it looks like a connection between the the blackness of space and then yeah. And that's caused here because we've got such poor atmospheric conditions. Yeah. yeah. That was third contact, so Venus is on its way off the disk of the Sun and there really can't be much transit left. 
right now we are in between the third and fourth contact uh, and it's really amazing, it's astonishing that we are seeing this. Yes. We are lucky that the weather is now good for the yep. final phase. Yeah. As we reach the end of the transit, with Venus just about to move off the face of the sun, a reverential quietness has descended on Svalbard. You can just see it here, so just as we come up to fourth contact, it's just visible with Venus on the edge of the sun's limb there. It's really going, isn't it? Yeah. Even without the black drop, you know, you're on this, if this was what you were using to make your measurements, say, mm -hmm. in the 17th century, has it gone, has it not? It's yeah. coming and going because of the atmosphere. That's right, if you don't have really good conditions, yeah. this becomes even harder. That's right. Oh, goodbye, Venus. Miguel and Michelle cast their laptops aside to see those final moments through the telescope, just as their predecessors did centuries ago. It's gone. Yeah. Quick, record the time, record the time. It's gone. So we think that's it. After hours of waiting for the skies to clear and then hours of watching Venus move very, very slowly across the disk, looking at the sun in different wavelength bands, seeing the sunspots, the filaments. It looks like Venus has finally gone from the face of the sun. It's rather depressing. I'm going to bed. <laughs> <laughs> You've been working hard, seriously. Even though they've been up all night, everyone is still basking in the glow of a successful transit. We are happy that we could do it because this morning it didn't look as if it would, have, would be possible. So I think uh, it was worth coming here with all the equipment. Oh, definitely, definitely. And I think we're quite happy. Yes. It was very rewarding that the sun finally shone for us at the end after a long, long night uh, with clouds passing in. And uh, yeah, it was fantastic. The Venus Twilight team, though, are still hard at work. The good news is that Thomas saw the aureole, that beautiful faint arc of light hanging in space. Australia, too, got this lovely view, although we still haven't heard from Ulaanbaatar and their elephant. Pete also managed to get a glimpse of the aureole, an impressive sight. On our Sky at Night Flickr site, we have lots of lovely images of Venus as it went across the sun. And they really show what a global experience this transit has been with images from as far afield as the South China Seas and Argentina, and even some nice ones from the rather cloud-ridden UK. Our spacecraft above the clouds also got some great images and movies showing Venus flying across the sun. This one from the Solar Dynamic Observatory, a very special event finished in the blink of an eye. Well, the transit's over in a brilliant blue sky, and I'm feeling a little odd right now. I've always known there'd be a transit of Venus in 2012, and now it's over, and I'll never see another one. That feels pretty strange. On the other hand, we came somewhere spectacular with some remarkable people, and we saw an amazing sight. That feels pretty special. What a magnificent sight. And I do hope you saw the transit of Venus. If not, look on the Sky at Night website. When I come back next month, we'll be talking about small amateur observatories. Until then, good night. <laughs>